Kubeflow has been mentioned a few times already in previous sessions, uh, which is the machine learning toolkit for Kubernetes. Um, and whilst putting on this event, uh, I've had the real pleasure to get to know Stefano Fioranzo, uh, based in North Italy uh, and employed by Ricto, who obviously uh, on the West Coast, San Mateo. Um, Stefan is a software engineer, author of Kale, which uh, the latest version was released on the 15th of June. And uh, if you've already been using uh, Jupyter Notebooks um, deploying to uh, Kubeflow pipelines, then uh, the, the whole simple annotate and deploy uh, that, um, uh, that, Kale is, um, that, that, that Kale does, you'll be very familiar with, with the tool. So um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Stefano. Hi, welcome to BrizTech MLOps. Are you there, Stefano? Hi. Hi, Nick. Hi. Thank Stefano. you for the introduction. No problem. So I will hand over to you, Stefano. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this talk on Kubeflow, Rock, and Kill. Uh, so this will be mainly an introductory talk to Kubeflow, how Kill works, and how we do data management uh, in Aricto. This is me. Uh, so as Nick said, I'm a software engineer at Aricto, and I'm basically working on all things Kubeflow, mainly on the tools and uh, APIs that as an end user, as a data scientist, you would use uh, when working with Kubeflow. Um, so in this session, uh, you will learn uh, a little bit about Kubeflow. Maybe you've heard about it already in the previous sections. Um, so uh, hope uh, you won't get bored too much. Uh, and then we'll see how Kale and Rock can help you to scale workloads uh, very easily and seamlessly from Jupyter Notebooks and how to integrate all of these with data management and reproducibility. Uh, so since this is a MLOps conference, I think I should be supposed to introduce MLOps and talk about it, but I'm pretty sure that the previous speakers did a great job on that. So let's dive straight into Kubeflow. Uh, Kubeflow is an open source project that is dedicated to making uh, machine learning workflows on Kubernetes uh, simple, portable, and scalable. Um, so why was Kubeflow built in the first place? Why do we need it? So I usually like to uh, reason about this over this image that you might be familiar with it already. So uh, what this image wants to convey is that Machine learning, especially in production, uh, is usually uh, thought of as being just about uh, machine learning code. And this is generally the wrong perception, right? Because in reality, deploying and managing machine learning in production is all about um, managing, deploying, uh, and maintaining all of the supporting systems around a specific machine learning model. And this can go from uh, data validation systems, data processing systems, serving, monitoring infrastructure. Uh, so in the end, uh, doing machine learning at scale requires lots of DevOps. And this is where Kubeflow comes in, by providing uh, several components that uh, simplify and automate all of these supporting systems. So we have serving components, uh, a way to uh, self-serve Jupyter Notebooks, uh, training operators, uh, and several tools, tools to deal with machine learning metadata, data management, uh, workflow building, etc. All of this is provided uh, as, a, um, as a collection of different tools and components that come together in nice UIs, uh, and what you can see here is the main Kubeflow Central dashboard that acts as your main um, uh, data plane, essentially, uh, where you can navigate between all of your components and, and do your work. You'll see uh, much more about it during uh, the, the workshop we'll, we'll have right after this talk. So to give you a general high-level perspective over the Kubeflow components. This is a sort of uh, enterprise architecture from the eyes of a software engineer, right? 
So on top, you have machine learning libraries and tools that the end user, the data scientist uses to build uh, the product, the machine learning products. And then um, Kubeflow packages and orchestrates all of the supporting systems that then run in a containerized way on top of Kubernetes. And Kubernetes runs on any cloud environment. So Kubeflow runs wherever Kubernetes runs. Then this is a, a high level overview instead from the data scientist perspective. Uh, data science is um, uh, a, a sort of uh, iterative process that goes through um, common uh, steps like data validation, feature engineering, training, serving, you know all about that. So Qflow provides the necessary components and tools to cover each step of the way. Now Qflow is already being used by several, both smaller companies and larger enterprises uh, to scale uh, their workloads and mm, collaborate in shared environments. So before diving into how Kubeflow can help you uh, in terms of machine learning ops, so that is from the perspective from data scientists, uh, I'd like to mention also a couple of very important features that Kubeflow uh, provides um, mostly to software engineers, but that are very important to end users as well. The first one is multi-user isolation. And at Ericto, uh, this is a very dear topic for us. We've contributed a lot to Kubeflow for uh, having a, a robust multi-tenant environment. So with Kubeflow, you can create um, namespaces where each user is the complete owner of their resources. So they don't have to worry about uh, mangling with uh, colleagues' resources, data sets, models. Uh, each one is the uh, sole owner of their own space, or you can have shared namespaces where people can collaborate on the same data sets, uh, Jupyter notebooks on, or models. Another very important feature is the decoupling between um, secrets, application credentials, and the actual user code. So with Kubernetes and Kubeflow, um, all of this is possible, this decoupling is possible because the administrator can just create secrets and tokens and grant um, these uh, secrets to specific users. And then users can use, consume um, these credentials in their development environment in a transparent way without having to embed this information into the, the user code. Okay, so now let's look at how Kubeflow allows you to um, continually improve and validate models going from your local environment, the Jupyter Notebook, to deploying at scale, and then closing the loop, going all the way back to iteration, debugging and experimentation uh, using data management. We will see and talk mostly about Kubeflow pipelines. You will see uh, in the workshop how we do that. Uh, and this is because on one hand, pipelines is the one of the most important tools in the Kubeflow toolkit. And on the other is because, well, data science is inherently a pipeline process, right? As we said before, there are a series of repeatable and steps that can be isolated, can be chained together, can be scaled independently. So we will focus mostly on how to simplify as much as possible the creation, the deployment and scalability of this kind of workloads and how to ensure that each one of these is completely reproducible and acts as a time machine for your data. So we'll do that with Kale and with the Rictos Rock. Also, Kale is a tool to convert data, um, Jupyter notebooks uh, into scalable pipelines, right? And, to, and this makes a lot of sense 
because notebooks are um, already uh, a series of independent steps in, in some sort of way, in that they are a series of uh, cells that are sequentially executed. And with some smart logic, we can um, split them up, isolating different components, and this lends very well to parallelize them, scale them, assign uh, different hardware requirements, apply data versioning, etc. So without Kale or Rock, um, building, writing and managing uh, scalable workloads in Kubeflow would be uh, somewhat more difficult, as usually you would have to write machine learning code that runs locally, you test it, you iterate over some test data set locally, then you would need to somehow package Docker images that ship with your code and uh, libraries and whatever dependency that your code relies on, push these Docker images and then build pipelines using a specific SDK, push uh, that uh, generated pipeline and then run it. Whenever you need to amend the code, you would need to go through all of this cycle again. But now you'll see how this becomes much more easier uh, with um, in that you can just tag notebook cells with Kale, with the Kale Jupyter Notebook UI. And then with the click of a button, just deploy the notebook. Kale will take care of the rest. And amending the code would just be a matter of changing the notebook locally, even running it again for testing and then clicking a button again. You'll see how this kind of workflow, workflow dramatically speeds up iteration time. Also, besides just converting a notebook to a simple pipeline, you will see how it becomes extremely easy to scale up uh, massively uh, this workload and also use hyperparameter tuning over the generated pipelines. This is using hyperparameter tuning is um, a very uh, usual uh, task that a data scientist goes through, right? Because machine learning models are usually parameterized with some hyperparameters. So one way of doing it is just tinkering manually with parameters and then applying heuristics and deciding by yourself uh, what model fits best. Or you can use some automatic, uh, some automated uh, tool like Catib. Catib is the Kubeflow's uh, official hyperparameter tuner. It supports several um, machine learning frameworks, um, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and others. And we've combined this uh, with our notebook to pipeline uh, conversion so that you can run large scale hyperparameter jobs directly from a notebook. And you can configure, configure every aspect of the hyperparameter tuning job from the search algorithm, the objectives, and the metrics that are produced by the pipelines directly from the notebook. And having as um, monitoring over the state of the job as well, directly from the notebook. So let's talk a little bit about Kale and how it works. So Kale is um, both a JupyterLab extension and a Python package. So these two combined together provide the end-to-end -end experience of converting a notebook to a pipeline without the need of learning any kind of additional SDK. Um, as you can see here, and you will see all of this live uh, right after this talk, um, Kill extends your base Jupyter Notebook UI with some uh, components that allow you to tag cells, create dependencies, configure the kind of deployment in a very easy way. And with the click of a button, have all of these uh, converted into a scalable and parallelizable pipeline. Kale does all of these by reading and introspecting the notebook annotations, and then also analyzing um, your Python code, detecting all of the data dependencies that are uh, that exist 
between the components that you are creating out of a sequentially executed notebook. All of these analysis and, and analysis and detection allows scale to create a pipeline that can marshal and serialize data between these independent components. Also, Kaggle takes care of generating all of the YAML files and um, additional boilerplate that you would need to actually deploy and monitor this pipeline. Kale is an open source project. You can find uh, all of the code in this GitHub repository and we'll welcome any kind of contribution or issue or interaction that you would like to make. Now, on one hand, um, this is great because Kale allows you to um, simplify the management of your machine learning code and how you can scale it. But as we said before, machine learning ops is not just about um, simplifying this, um, this, this process of going uh, at scale easy, easily. It's about to simplify also the management of all the supporting systems. And the most important one is how you manage your data. So that's what we do at Arecto with Rock. And let's see where actually Rock sits in the Kubeflow uh, stack. So this is a, a diagram, a picture from um, a TFX paper from 2017 that illustrates a, a high level overview of um, an enterprise machine learning architecture. So these main components are packaged in TFX libraries. And in our case, it's Kubeflow that um, provides uh, containerized components as well as well as hyperparameter tuning. On top, Qflow also provides the necessary um, UIs, SDKs, interfaces to monitor, deploy, and manage all of these systems that can that eventually run as containers on top of Kubernetes. So with all of these, you would need to run, uh, create in general pipelines or workloads that uh, consume, read, write data. And in general, you would need to do this in a vendor specific way, using specific APIs that maybe access some object store. But then Arecto uh, sits on the storage layer and allows you to write code that is completely dependent on the kind of uh, storage that sits underneath. How do we do that? Well, we have extended Qflow to be data aware. So to be using PVCs, persistent volume claims that are uh, Kubernetes primitives to actually use virtual disks out of uh, local super fast uh, SSDs. And Arito, by implementing um, the, the Kubernetes uh, storage interface sits on the side of the critical IO path and allows applications to read and write data super fast on their local SSDs, while at the same time taking snapshots of this data, so immutable um, point in time in a Git-like way of, of your work, and then even um, saving it into an object store for long-term archival and sharing uh, these snapshots across locations. So you can go from your experimentation environment and then transition with the snapshot to your training, maybe on GCP environment to scale up your workload. And then once you're done with another snapshot, go to production and maybe serve a model. So um, we can see here um, what uh, would generally happen in a um, usual environment where uh, at each step of the way to access and read data, to make it available to other colleagues, you would need to interact with an object store. So in the first step, you would need to pull some data using some specific API, uh, transform data, create a new bucket, maybe name it uh, uh, with a timestamp when you are doing your operation and then communicate to your colleague where your bucket is, is stored, pull it again, you see how this process easily become cumbersome. But now with the Ricto, you basically have a common layer that is actually accessing just local storage, where you can uh, read some data locally, transform it 
snapshot it, and then uh, keep on going with new snapshots, new transformations, new uh, workloads, and be completely reproducible. Also, since Rock um, saves and stores all of these snapshots uh, in an object store, you can then work across locations seamlessly um, to continue your work. Maybe a colleague of yours wants to build on top of what you did or to completely reproduce something that you did in the past, starting from an immutable snapshot. Let's also look at how Rock can help in making pipelines in Kubeflow completely reproducible and debuggable. Let's say we have an initial validation step, which consumes data from a disk. And then after it's done, it snapshots this data. So then we have a processing step that does the same thing. It starts from the previous snapshot and then processes the data and snapshots it again. But then a training step fails. So what do you do? Well, you can just clone the previous snapshot, inspect it, maybe create a new notebook out of that snapshot, debug, do whatever you want to do to uh, fix the error. And then right from there, take a, a new snapshot and keep on going with the pipeline by snapshotting at every step of the way. So what we've seen is that uh, you can uh, simply uh, orchestrate and simplify uh, your infrastructure with Kubeflow, going from managing users, isolating uh, resources or sharing them. And then you can streamline your workflows going from Jupyter notebooks uh, using Kale to scaling um, this local code into uh, scalable and parallelizable pipelines. All of these with the guarantee that your work is being uh, reproduced and you can always go back in time to see what happened, to debug, to improve your work. Uh, so we'll see all of these things in action uh, right after this talk. At Aricto, um, we are heavily contributing uh, to Kubeflow. Um, we've made lots and lots uh, of upstream changes, uh, especially uh, in managing um, in a self-serve way, uh, Jupyter notebooks. We've implemented pipelines, um, volume support in pipelines. Uh, we've extended the authorization and authentication model. We're providing a, a portable and integrating an integrated um, Kubeflow environment, mini KF. And again, you'll see uh, all of the things I will run later will be exactly on this kind of environment and much more. Kubeflow is a big community. Uh, lots and lots of companies uh, contribute to the project. And there are lots of social channels that you can interact with, both as a contributor or as an end user, when you can have your voice heard in case you have issues or requests. So get involved and we'll see you there. And thank you. I'm looking forward to see, seeing you uh, afterwards in the workshop or to answer all of your questions. Thank you so much. That was a cracking outline of the stack. A round of applause. Woo! Woo! Nice one. Well done. Um, so uh, there's a few questions on the chat. Uh, they're all from me. <laughs> so uh, people, if you do have uh, some, some questions for Stefano on anything that he's raised there, please do post questions in, in the chat. Um, uh, so a couple of reflections um, f from, from me. Um, I'm just wondering, you, you touched on there on the, uh, the, the snapshots. Um, so just wondering, you, you so outlined how it does it, but could you just so that say the problem that it's trying to solve, is, is that trying to solve data leakage, you know, having the correct data for training? Well, I would say that, um, first of all, it tries to solve the issue of um, 
continually experimenting and iterating with data and moving your work um, from a local environment to a, another location or into um, a scalable pipeline. Because if you think about it, without being able to access local storage and seamlessly transition uh, to executing the same code uh, on the same data on a pipeline or um, on a scalable service um, diminishes in, in a way the, the time to production and the time to iteration. Um, so if you're running on a notebook, you would have to push and pull data from an external service, build the images, uh, package things, and then eventually maybe once everything is working on, or once you've uh, you've talked with your uh, machine learning engineer supporting you on this, you are able to deploy a pipeline. But now if you can snapshot your local data, um, if you have something that allows you to snapshot and say, I want this exact same data to work on this uh, pipeline that is running on GCP or that is running on this other cluster, on this other location, then you are the sole owner of your workflow. You can handle it completely by your own and you have a completely a complete Git-like time machine of what you do at every step of the way. Mm -hmm. And this maybe leads me on to another of the, of the questions that, that I had was around how tightly coupled are all these components? So for example, if I want to use a different versioning system, um, could I swap in uh, a different versioning system? How, how tightly coupled is the stack? Well, Kale um, by itself is not necessarily uh, coupled to Rock in the sense that Kale by itself um, provides the functionality to annotate notebooks, to parse these notebooks and create Qflow pipelines out of them. But then uh, it sort of exposes a, a number of APIs to snapshot your environment and to integrate these snapshots and to restore them into the Qflow pipeline itself. Of course, without having this kind of functionality supporting this um, transition from notebook to pipeline, um, you basically lose uh, half of the benefits because you would still have to build the Docker images and to bring over uh, dependencies and data. But by itself, yes, uh, Kale does not strongly depend on, on Rock. Okay. And uh, so we have a question here from, from Phil. Thanks for, thanks for the question. Uh, and Phil asks, uh, an often cited mantra is don't use notebooks in production. Uh, so what do you think about this and what can you recommend to maintain quality? Well, that's true. Uh, so what we focus mostly uh, is, um, let's say, providing um, all sorts of automation and simplification to be to allow you to, mm, in, in a way, productionalize uh, notebooks. Because yes, maintaining a single notebook is not a something that you can do in production. What you maybe can do is maintaining a pipeline uh, which runs over snapshots of data and is completely reproducible. So you can do that with Kale. And um, as, a, as an enterprise uh, feature, we are also working on essentially expanding this same paradigm to um, actual Python code that you can commit in a, in a Git repository. Mm -hmm. So, so fo focusing a little bit more on Kale, uh, then you, you know it, it's identifying all of the data dependencies. Uh, so presumably, it, it's building some kind of um, DAG. Do you just want to go into that in a little bit and, and how how it does that? So, when you have a notebook, you execute it sequentially, right? The notebook um, has a has a Python kernel, well, where where every cell is executed. So. If you say a equal one, that variable becomes um, available in the entire notebook context. So when you split up the notebook uh, into multiple components that are chained together and executed independently from one another, you need to say, look, if in this cell I've uh, defined a variable 
And at the bottom of the notebook, I'm using it. But these two cells end up executing in two different pipeline components that they need some way uh, to make them talk to each other. So that's what KL does. It actually looks at, at the code before executing it. And by parsing the code, by actually parsing the abstract syntax tree, it finds and matches all of these data dependencies and has an automatic way of marshalling uh, to and from disk um, whatever object data type it may find. Hmm. And interestingly, we, we heard earlier from, from Cookpad saying that allowing researchers to, to keep their existing tooling uh, was, was pretty important because actually that's, you know, that there's legacy there and they've got tools that they are used to using. So do you see that Kale is therefore this bridge, you know, it's the bridge between the, 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 no, the notebook, which is familiar, uh, into the, you know, the, the more pipeline oriented world of, of Kubeflow? So it was that that was the intention uh, in, in terms of allowing people to, to keep the tools that they're, they're used to using? Well, definitely. I think this was uh, back in the day, one of the main reasons uh, why I started this project. Um, this was um, actually, this was part of my um, master thesis and where I was working previously, this was really one of the most important reasons, keeping uh, the tooling that we were already used um, on like Jupyter notebooks, where the main interface that this data scientists uh, were used to for building data processing pipelines or machine learning models. So that mm. was probably the main reason. Yes. And yeah, that, that, that completely makes sense. And, and and you released it on what fifteenth of June, and uh, presu presumably on a personal level, your life has changed quite a lot since since then. Uh, yeah, actually, the the first. We've released uh, the first uh, official version more than a year ago. Uh, and yes, definitely the project has matured a lot and uh, it's, now it's completely different from what it started um, back in the day. Mm -hmm. We're still improving it. We have actually just released a minor um, new version a couple of weeks ago and we're targeting a major release very soon. Okay. And could, could you sort of just outline maybe from the Erecto point of view, obviously you know, there's a clear strategy around uh, you know, adopting open source. Uh, could, could you sort of say something around uh, you know, Erecto and open source and how, how they sort of view these kind of developments? So at Erecto, we are very focused on um, collaborating and pushing upstream whatever we do with Qflow because we really believe uh, in the community efforts, right? A project can really uh, grow and mature and have wide adoption if there is a strong community backing it. So we're really keen on sharing uh, design thought, uh, leadership in authorization or authentication implementations and really interacting with the people that then actually use Qflow or as well as us, uh, push their uh, new features upstream. Mm -hmm. And, and could, could you outline in, in terms of Qflow, clearly Erecto is a major contributor, but are there other you know, companies who, who are also um, in, involved as, as contributors as well as individuals, obviously? Yes, of course. Well, the, uh, one of the main contributors is uh, Google. Actually, uh, Qflow started out from um, uh, from as, as an open source project from Google as a uh, sort of rebranding of some, something that they were doing internally. But then uh, other big names like uh, um, IBM, Canonical, even Seldon. I think someone from Seldon is uh, uh, is here today. So yeah, lots lots of names. Actually, there was this, yeah, you can see here uh, lots and lots of big names that contribute more or less uh, to the entire project. Mm. And, and do you see that as a, a bit of a, a theme within MLOps? We, we've certainly heard uh, from a number of people, a number of companies who have either open sourced their product um, uh, and you know, for competitive uh, advantages as well as uh, a sort of a community uh, approach. Um, so do you see that as something which is just becoming increasingly common uh, for, for vendors? Yeah, I think so. Probably 
um, at this large scale, uh, starting to maintain your own completely branded software solution is not scalable, right? So when you can, as a, as a company, offer some kind of enterprise solution to um, an open source software that is publicly uh, recognize, recognized as being uh, strong and, um, and competitive, it works much better because otherwise you wouldn't have the resources to compete with this kind of large scale uh, community efforts. Mm. Yeah, I see. Yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. Well, Stefano, if, um, if people want to reach out to you, uh, will, will you be on the platform uh, today for any sort of connections and, uh, and presumably be able to answer any other further questions that people have? Of course, and I'll be happy to. Okay, amazing. Well, uh, we'll, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Stefano, for, for your time and your, your presentation today.